because Historians Without Borders deals with uh, uh, conflicts uh, and uh, uh, tries to uh, sort out the historical roots of conflicts and help in uh, conflict uh, resolution and conflict uh, prevention. Uh, and very, many special thanks to Rinna, uh, who has uh, taken the initiative, the initiative to arrange this uh, meeting at a very short notice. And uh, my thanks to all of you who have joined us today. And I will hand now over to Rinna, who will moderate the meeting. Thank you, Erki, and um, thank you for everyone joining us. Um, so I would maybe start by setting a few ground rules. Our meeting today is recorded, so um, just know that if you uh, make a question or uh, post a question, it's going to be recorded. I would ask uh, people to post um, their questions in the chat or to announce there that you would like to make a question. I think this is the easiest for us to moderate. Um, I'm Rina Kula. I'm an associate professor of global history at Tampere University, and I'm also a vice president of the Historians Without Borders in Finland. Um, I have the pleasure today to uh, invite uh, and welcome two speakers, Oliver Reisner, who's a professor in European and Caucasian Studies at Ilia State University in Tbilisi, he has worked previously as a project manager at the EU delegation to Georgia, and he works on questions of democratization, minorities, education, youth, labor, and social affairs. Uh, our second speaker of today is uh, David Gisakariani, who is a researcher of modern Georgian history. He has uh, guest lectured at Tampere in our global history courses. Uh, he's a civil rights activist, advocate, and was very active as an activist now in the current 2023 pro protests. As our time is short, I would like to invite uh, Professor Reisner uh, to mm -hmm. begin his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rina. I'm very glad to be here. In, uh, the invitation by Historians Without Borders, very much subscribe to your uh, uh, agenda. So um, being a historian myself, I will have a very short introduction about the background historical, but also uh, um, social in the political science, they call it past dependency. Maybe we can start with the first slide then. Um, I can't see the presentation right now. So what you know probably is that in Georgia in 2011-12 after parliamentary elections there was the first uh, change of government legitimized by uh, um, elections. And and uh, in that period, this was uh, 10 years, more than 10 years ago, the Georgian dream came to power through elections and replaced the uh, United National Movement with the outgoing president, Mikhail Saakashvili. They were very fond. This was a, a coalition, a bloc, coalition block of different oppositional parties. Georgian dream as a party was just established and um, they promised that now there will be a new democratic era starting with only coalition governments, with a cooperation with civil society and so on. And maybe we can go to the uh, first slide now. Yeah. And one of these coalition members was David Usupashvili, who became the Speaker of the Parliament then in 2012 until the next elections, 2016. He is from the Republican, or he was then from the Republican Party. And he was one and is one of the very few politicians that really cast a very serious question about the development of Georgia. Um, and he gave a speech in February 2015 on the dilemma of building our state. And I would say that this 
understanding of statehood as a civic entity is one of the major challenges that still actual until today. I cannot, I have only 10 minutes, so therefore I cannot go too deep. But here in these quotes that I gave, really you can see that a politician was really thinking of the root causes, of the root challenges that this country, Georgia, after 70 years under Soviet rule and 20 years uh, uh, of independence is still facing in creating a civic understanding of statehood and not an ethnocultural one. This is one very important point because very uh, most of the uh, um, George and Dream Party uh, politicians were not that uh, outspoken because the party is very young and many of them came to positions thanks that they were working in one of in, in one of Pizina Ivanishvili's uh, uh, then prime minister and who retired after one year in power and uh, they were working for him a billionaire who is the gray eminence uh, behind the scenes so he retired and then is managing uh, uh, the Georgian dream from behind the scenes maybe we can go on to the next slide yeah. Okay. So one. So this is a political setting. Then I want to shortly really talk about the uh, um, um, value orientations that are discussed here. If you can see, this is the latest uh, data from the Inglehart Wells Award World Value Survey, World Value Cultural Map, as they say. And you see, Georgia is somewhere uh, in the part that is more traditional, where re importance of religion, parent-child ties, defense of authority, traditional family ties, and so on are highlighted on the one hand, and on the other hand, the survival mood. And during the last 30 years, so the first Ingelhard Welsi cultural map was conducted in 1995. So in uh, these 20 years, really Georgia did go down from a zero level down into so it became more traditional traditionally oriented due to the inefficiencies of the political elites to deliver uh, uh, main issues of overcoming socioeconomic hardships poverty employment and so on out migration is still a major issue and might be one of the reasons why so many people were out on the streets because they were looking forward for finding jobs in in the european union in the future okay maybe we move on to the next slides which is a little bit more historical one but really it is something that Georgia's transition over the last 20 years since independence was really uh, not a straightforward one, not the uh, uh, success story in the beginning with the dark 1990s, with separatist conflicts, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and so on. I would say there was a re-traditionalization that already started in the late 1970s as a response to the growing inefficiency of the uh, state-managed economy in the Soviet Union and the fight of the Soviet authorities, central and also local under Eduard Shevardnadze, against what is come uh, old tradition and corruption. This strengthened the informal network relations and informal policies or groups, network groups, that are uh, still something that is still uh, uh, ongoing and uh, in the latest events last week, really, we could observe that, that within two days after hard protests, really, the, the, the leadership, Ivanishvili and the party leadership decided to uh, withdraw from this project of this um, 
agent, uh, agent of international influence um, uh, law project. And really, this is something that was going on behind the scenes without the, the members of parliament being involved in this reconsideration. And this is all based on what is uh, called in political science neo patrimonialism that really continued. It changed its forms, its appearance in, uh, with the Saakashvili government from 2000. Uh, uh, three 2004 after Rose Revolution became more pro-Western, explicitly neoconservative uh, uh, and pro-American. But then after the uh, 2008 war in, 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 in Georgia, uh, it moved on towards European integration as a major, major priority. And this is really now what uh, uh, became the, the crystallizing point, maybe not this law in itself, but that this law, when it is a, would have been adopted, would be a stumbling stone for European integration, EU integration in the future. Um, yeah, this is uh, some points, so I do not have much time. I think these are the main points here um, that I could highlight. Um, for the moment, so later on, maybe we can then ask, uh, identify more points for discussion later. Maybe then I will hand over to my colleague, David Jishkariani. Yeah. So, Oliver, thank you for your brilliant introduction and moving in depth of the subject. So, uh, last year, at the end of 2022, nobody could imagine that such law will appear in public because um, some actors said that there will be some um, radicalization of the processes, but uh, you see among the civic society activists, uh, scientists and people who are active in public, nobody expected such kind of law pro project. But in the beginning of this year, everything became quite clear and obvious that Georgian dream was going to adopt the law about for international agents. Uh, this law really pushed uh, uh, mostly civil society organizations and different actors uh, to become more active because there is no one monopoly on the civil society. The civil society is quite uh, uh, different in Georgia from far right left movement to far right movement. So they're very complex and different. And plus, uh, in Georgian case, um, civil society, and uh, there is quite difficult to have a clear differences between scientific society and civic society actors, because due to economic uh, situation, uh, everything is overlapped in this case. Um, but uh, uh, in uh, January, when uh, all, uh, all of this became clear, and in the beginning of February, uh, it was clear that something strange is happening around, but uh, still there was expectation that there should be, be long discussions about this law. Unfortunately, Georgian Dream and uh, speakers of the Georgian Dream and um, the unit is uh, called Might of People, uh, who in reality is not registered as an independent party, but they are part, they said, announced that they are independent, but in reality they are part of Georgian Dream political party, they st uh, started discussions of this law in parliament. And on the first discussions, it was obvious that civil society actors are not going to accept this law easily. And uh, they started demonstration, they uh, pushed uh, different uh, discussions via TV and broadcast, uh, uh, discussing all the details of this uh, law because the Georgian drew and uh, supporters of this law, they were um, referencing uh, of um, Foreign Agents Registration Act from US, which was adopted in 1938. Uh, and what is interesting that in the description of the law, it was mentioned about the law I mentioned above, uh, a law in Israel, a law in some other countries, but it was not mentioned that this law looks like uh, law in which was adopted in Russia in 12, 2012 and it was not mentioned also Azerbaijan which also adopted this law some seven in 2007 
uh, and plus it was not mentioned also Hungary at all. So uh, they proposed really two versions of law. One uh, law they called uh, the Georgian law, and it was like more um, uh, Russian law. And another law was proposed, and they said that uh, if uh, it is U.S. law, so you you now you have to change between these two laws. Uh, but uh, in uh, in uh, reality, we find out that uh, somehow the Georgian dream helped and supported to mobilize all different actors of society to move to pro protest. Uh, because uh, all of the actors started immediately gathering in front of parliament and it was not coordinated by any political party, I can uh, tell you directly, because uh, none of uh, the oppositional parties has such a big leg legitimacy or support from uh, society to organize such a big demonstrations. It was all, especially the first day was organized from Facebook when these uh, uh, posted on Facebook that their Georgian dream is going to put uh, the law on voting on plenary session. And in one hour, some thousand people gathered in front of parliament. After this, uh, everything became more or less uh, in a quite a hard way to work because on the first day it was a already used to the um, a gas and uh, demolish uh, the demonstrations. And the next day it was clear that the Georgian dream will receive a much bigger demonstration from public. If on the first day, mostly they used to be a civil society activist. So the next day, uh, mostly demonstrants were from generation Z. So the generation who uh, are not very active, who is not very active in politics and mostly they try, they are not involved in everyday politics, but somehow they became the main actors during the demonstrations. Uh, uh, but uh, I will not move in details about the demonstrations because I will move back what is uh, in front of our screens. Uh, so immediately when uh, the demonstrations began and uh, these, uh, the Russian bloggers uh, in, except Simonian, uh, sorry, because she is not a blogger, she is a propagandist. Uh, they immediately started to putting all this uh, news from Georgia and uh, pushing uh, news that Georgia is losing sovereignty because it is collapse of US uh, State Department's plan uh, uh, to change the power in um, uh, Georgia, to change the government in Georgia. Plus, there was a clear messages that the Maidan is repeating in Georgia. So for Russian military bloggers, uh, they had only one, they had the same message box because if, um, and it is common uh, if uh, somebody is carefully observing this situation, if uh, in 2022 after invasion Ukraine, uh, military blogger, bloggers sometimes we are writing different uh, things and publishing different things. Uh, after some months, all of them started to publish the same news with the same words and with the same message boxes. So here we can observe really these same message boxes every hour. So here's, I put also here Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, this uh, uh, leader of Chechen, uh, Republic of Chechnya, who is one of the most active bloggers uh, on a Telegram channel because I'm observing this. And here it is really quite well presented that uh, uh, Russian military brokers wanted to present uh, the ongoing situation in Georgia like a, na another Maidan in uh, Tbilisi, which is not really true because Maidan had different reasons. And uh, in uh, Tbilisi, the reason was totally uh, different. I will ask for next slide. Uh, no, the next one it's, uh, goes to Oliver. Next, okay, this one. Uh, in the beginning, uh, the Russian officials uh, denied any kind of connection with uh, uh, this law. For example, it was said by uh, Dmitry Pesko, the spokesperson of uh, Russian Federation. But later on, uh, Maria Zakharova said, uh, announced also another. Um, Side, uh, statement uh, that uh, it is uh, how US is undertaking the control over uh, Georgia again. 
Uh, so it was clear that the Russian uh, political elite, or at least the advisors uh, of them, they are really observing what is happening in Georgia. And again, uh, it was offered like that uh, losing of sovereignty, so no having in consideration the will of use uh, uh, the political uh, parties or the Georgian society who, re who somehow, at least part of the Georgian society, who was ready uh, to protest everything on uh, the streets. But uh, with uh, the, um, uh, as you know, after two days, Georgian dream government uh, withdrew the law and it was one of the uh, like uh, best steps from them because uh, really after the last demolition of the demonstration that it was a huge protest among uh, the youngsters and among the uh, society in the, in the country but immediately after um, uh, withdrawal of this law the prime minister of georgia was not uh, in uh, country uh, the prime minister was in berlin and he was opening uh, the uh, a, a touristical exhibition in Berlin uh, and the Ministry of Culture and Youth, uh, she was also not in the country, so it's quite strange uh, the situation. And when he returned back yesterday, I thought before yesterday that these processes are finished, but uh, yesterday I would like, next slide please. Uh, yep. Uh, yesterday, me, Mr. Hari Bashwili, he had an interview on a TV channel and he had a long speech. He criticized the generation who was protesting this. He criticized the public who was protesting this. And uh, in the end of his presentation, said uh, he said he mentioned that army, church and police, so these are the three main institutions of the statehood is based on in Georgia. So here I go back what Professor Reisner may mentioned that in this case, uh, Prime Minister Gary Bashwili chose such kind of traditional, very traditional way of uh, thinking. And he moved back to these red lines, which was also presented in front of um, us. Uh, so uh, at this moment, the protests, the active protests are finished, but I think the process is not finished and we are in the uh, middle of this process and uh, we, it will uh, be shown in some times how Georgian political elite will work on and continue their coexisting. So my 10 minutes are finished so I stop here and thank you. Thank you. I believe we already have a few questions. Um, I would also like to invite more questions. Uh, you can post them in the chat. Then we also know the uh, time that they arrived. Um, Professor Reisner, are you with us? Yes, I am here. I'm here. <laughs> Good. Um, um, I suppose maybe I could start with a question to both of you. Um, my question would be um, to, um, since we had now two presentations, one dealing with the longer history and identity and the other one on the more political background of this um, protest. My question is a little bit to the future of, on how to solve the problem. Um, how do you see in the future the balancing the relations that Georgia has with its close to neighbors with the European Union and also with Russia and Moscow? And if you think that that would be something that has to do with the future or is the solution found domestically elsewhere? Uh, if if I may start, then I would say in, in the slide that was uh, uh, not so visible, I think what we see in, in Georgia, like also in other post-Soviet countries, is that it is a pluralizing but not a pluralist society. So the developments of civic participation by civil society uh, democratic achievement, independence of institutions are not 
secure yet that they are functioning according to the official and formal assignment. We can see that in Georgia, for example, we had several upheavals of po a public protest against really a, a, a ruling party that became a state party. And, um, but there is still the problem that the political elites do not really want to uh, limit their own powers. Yeah, so this is what we can observe right now in, uh, in this uh, latest protest, because the intention of these agent law, Russian law, as it, it was uh, uh, mentioned in the protests here in Tbilisi, uh, is really so to stigmatize the few remaining independent voices in the civil society that were mainly funded with EU money, with Western EU member state funding and US funding. So really othering these voices really was already in preparing for the upcoming elections, parliamentary elections in October 2024. So this is really some power securing uh, um, uh, initiative. We do not know if this was something that was imposed from Russia. I will not go into these speculations. The re responses that David presented hint at that, that there is something that really Russia at least was hoping that Georgia would change side and would become another ally of this reassemblage of the former Soviet Union. So we will not know, we do not know, but really what these uh, politicians of Georgian Dream had to realize was that there is a serious public uh, a resistance to this direction, going into this direction. And I, as I highlighted really, probably for many of them, because they were not active in party politics or NGOs and so on, really the law in itself was not the main point, but that this law would be, become a cornerstone really in destroying the European membership perspective for Georgia. This was probably a decisive issue. During the protests already, uh, 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 Georgian Dream realized that with this law that really with it, maybe not in its formal form, but in its intention was like in Russia really to, to uh, uh, eliminate civil society organizations as a uh, 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 critical actor here, that they realized that they went too far with this Russian law. They la launched a new attempt really to come back on, on the field, but they are now in the defense. They called it then uh, towards Europe in dignity. And what this dignity is a reference to the sovereignty, what the Russian uh, commentators were referring to. Yeah. So because we can't follow this uh, people's power, what David mentioned, these people's power people were really very much using ethnocultural, anti-Western, anti-European, a discourse, uh, also really provoking the US EU ambassador, something that we have never heard before in Georgian public politics. This kind of Western bashing, Western diplomat bashing, and so especially after the European Union, really. Uh, put a lot of effort in really helping Georgia overcoming the political crisis with the growing polarization between the two leading parties, the ruling Georgian dream and the oppositional United National Movement. But this was only a fight between political factions. The majority of the population did not participate in, in this. And this is really the qualitative new point here that uh, the population said no. And it mean, meant that then the Georgian dream has to be ready to use more force than they already used during these protests. I think their reputation is already down now. We will see it 
can be really that uh, uh, this party will fall apart very soon because power is very fluid and was very hierarchical, built on the informal uh, uh, authority of the patron, and this is Bizina Ivanishvili. And all these parliamentarians that within two days changed, had to change their mind, are really became obvious that they are marionettes and not independent representatives of the public will. So we will see how this will develop. It might be that really this will uh, be cause a huge backfire to the Georgian dream in their intentions to secure their grips on, on state power in the future. Thank you. So I really don't think any resources at this time to have any kind of um, relations between Georgia and Russia. The, uh, Georgia has uh, the special representative in Georgia-Russian relations and uh, Premier Minister of Georgia, and the same is uh, from the Russian side, and they are discussing some humanitarian uh, uh, questions officially. I don't know what they are discussing uh, in different meetings, but it's also um, more than institutional relations, what only were mentioned here, because uh, they, you know, the Karasin and Abashidze knew each other from their student times in Moscow. So these uh, networks, so the former Soviet networks, lives until nowadays. And um, in this case, we have to underline the importance of Abashidze because he was the ambassador of Georgia to Russia for a long time. Uh, so in, uh, in reality, in Georgian society, it will be quite difficult uh, to propose for a political elite to start any kind of uh, um, discussions with Russia and it is connected somehow with our last uh, um, uh, slide. It is a shadow of memory because uh, Georgia officially did not recognize that uh, uh, Georgia as a state lost the war uh, in 2028. So that's the very most important because uh, the actors of uh, the war from the Georgian side are still uh, in power and in poor position, but they still are publicly very active. So here immediately come the responsibility of how they behave or how they act or how they plan this uh, um, during that time. So nobody, especially that part of the political actors don't want to speak about this. That's why I think uh, uh, the future of Georgian Russian relations highly depends how we will rethink not 19th and 20th century, but uh, the contemporary event like uh, so-called August War. Um, in reality, it's another problem that I think that the political elite uh, does not feel that they need to discuss anything with Russia. Uh, and they think that um, uh, all these informal uh, networks are absolutely enough for this kind of uh, um, relations and it again comes back to the legacy and the shared history of the Soviet uh, Union because uh, um, the actors started negotiating in that time and uh, there is no new paradigm in these relations unfortunately after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Even generation is the same from the Soviet time. That also underlines a lot and means a lot. And I will also wanted to and clarify that I mean military bloggers like, uh, sorry, Dimitri correctly mentioned here the, uh, in my presentation, military bloggers, so, so-called Vainne Karispandienti in Russia, Vain So yeah, that's what I wanted to respond. Thank you. We have a question from Heta Hetman. Yes, hello. Thank you very much, David and Oliver, for your very interesting uh, introductions. Um, I had a question, and I believe Oliver or also um, basically already already asked uh, or already answered it uh, by saying that there was um, that we can see that there was no real popular um, uh, response um, or, or backing to the to the laws proposed by Georgian Dream. But but I would still like to ask or somehow specify that that where some was the government expecting that there could be a um, 
um, support for this kind of policy or could it be that uh, that there are some kind of um how do you say ethnic or other kind of historical reasons for that they could have believed that there could be some kind of popular support for it or could maybe they were expecting that uh, or maybe maybe the war had something to do that the war in ukraine had something to do that in another situation there could have been support for it i don't know do you have any thoughts on this mm -hmm. Tato, would you like to start or after you it's Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, the point is that um, I would say really this is something that uh, the Georgian dream thought that they would manage to get this under control, that this would be only this opposition party, so a limited amount of of uh, uh, people being out there on the uh, uh, in front of the parliament. This is a traditional place where since the, late, since the late 1980s, public protest was gathering. Really, they lost touch with the population, especially with the youth, because the youth was most prominent here, and they did not want to get uh, uh, embraced by politicians. So they threw away politicians that tried to grab the microphone and so because this is our protest and not your party politics. In one way, this is really good because the youth is uh, uh, probably also the kids from, from, from politicians who are supporting the ruling Georgian dream and so on, really something that uh, 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 became a broader really issue and that they realize really they will have to cope with this kind of protest even growing further than these uh, already these two nights already demonstrated or, or showed that yeah um, um the, the point is also the quote that uh, david gave from prime minister rari bashvili the three in in public opinion survey these three uh, most trusted institutions a policy, uh, the number one is the church, then the army, and then the policy, po po police. Yeah, so it's a very authoritarian mindset in the broader society, still there. And he tries then to realign with the public uh, in that way by highlighting that. So they are political technologists, but they underestimated really the public mood here. And they underestimated the will of, of these young people, really, that they do not want anything that could do harm to this Western European integration, what is also in the Constitution. And now they really have to face, they try really now to go back and to present that, ah, oh, this is in line with the European Union and, and so on. Uh, um, but as David also said, so really all the warnings from the commission, from uh, Charles Michel and from, from Borel and so on and so forth, where, and even we had a demarche for the first time since, I, I do not know, times unthinkable that the European Union and the 27 member states had a demarche about uh, uh, the law and about uh, uh, the imprisonment, the conditions of imprisonment of uh, former President Saakashvili here. Yeah, so this all is not in line with these principles. Therefore, uh, the challenge will be still ahead. And uh, uh, I am a little bit afraid that they might then resort, if they see no other way, that they might also resort to uh, uh, other administrative uh, forms really in trying to, to uh, strengthen their grips on power. So this is not, is not the end. As it was said by some uh, uh, journalists, so the battle has been won, but the war is not over yet. Yeah? And really it is pluralizing, and, but not pluralist. So really to have this point of no return, that really the institutions can follow their formal assignments. And this is what we do not. We have always this informal rulership with Ivanishvili. There was, I've seen in the, in the questions also, we do not know what is coming from, from Russia. Ivanishvili made his billions in Russia. 
one of the uh, uh, parliamentarians from the European Socialists, uh, 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 India, he has a business in, 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 in Russia. Yeah, so, he has, uh, so they cannot really act independently. Since 2012 until today, Russia became the main trading partner of Georgia from place five in 2012 to the first one. So it's not only that 20% are occupied by Russian forces in South Ossetia and Abkhazia, with these uh, uh, conflicts uh, leave, left really without perspective of really being uh, addressed seriously. And then on the other hand, Russia main major trading partner and with the uh, outbreak of uh, Russian uh, invasion in Ukraine in 22, in February, we have 120,000 or more, mainly businesses that were transferred from Russia uh, to Georgia with its neoliberal policy. You can open up your business within one day. So it means really the economic pressure is also enormous uh, uh, on Georgia now because the Lari was so strong as it wasn't really for, for five years or so, thanks to the Russian money that now flows through Georgia, through the business. And only a minor part are really political opposition or really oppositional minded people, but they are also here in, in Georgia. And I think this would be a great chance really to try to establish a dialogue with these people uh, on how there will be a relationship with Russia in the future. But of course, this is also beyond the scope of uh, uh, Russian exiles and Georgian uh, opposition, really. Uh, Georgia, uh, Russia will remain Georgia's northern partner. Uh, and and uh, uh, it becomes now, of course, with the war in Ukraine, Russia has other priorities, but this can also change once uh, uh, the war is over. Yeah, there are much more informal, non-visible means possible here than uh, 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 it is. Uh, so they, then that is not a need to have an open war uh, with Georgia. This is already what uh, took place in 2008. Yeah, I will add one more me in detail that Georgia economy, Georgian politicians highly depends on uh, Russia, not only the Dina Ivanishvili who really all end the money in 19th in Russia, but also there are some members of in oppositional party, United National Movement, for example, who also end money in Russia. Uh, and also after 2008, the whole energy system of Georgia, if not partly at least, moved to Russian companies. Uh, so of course we ha Georgia highly depends uh, is highly depending on the Russian economy and uh, all these Russian companies were presented in Georgia market due to this uh, liberal approach that anybody can register this not, not even a one day you need some three or four hours and your company is registered in Tbilisi and plus um, their real estate business who is controlled by the political elites not only from the representative of Georgia and Dream, but also from the opposition. Uh, the, uh, all these flats uh, sold in Bartumi and Tbilisi, these are two main important places. They were sold to Russians because, and, they, and this real estate the business is just flourishing and I don't know how it will be the future of these two urban areas in the country. Nothing is good um, is happening in this uh, direction. And, uh, and of course, uh, having such kind of informal connections with Russia, Russia makes it uh, quite difficult to analyze and to guess what is happening in reality. Because uh, with the Georgian teeny population is 3,700,000. So it's, it's less than several, uh, several cities in Russia. So it's quite easy to manipulate and to have a pressure on this uh, country. That's why this... Uh, uh, European Union and other actors in involvement in economy and social life is very important for Georgia. That was one of the main uh, dilemmas for protesters when they moved in the street because these uh, traumas from the past are still alive. 
maybe the generation is not alive, but the traumas are alive. So that's a very important decision. And uh, between the political elites and political system it, itself, they started to um, abstain each other with uh, political technologies, not listening the uh, public because uh, for several years, the public opinion survive show that approximately 60, 65 percent is not going to for elections, or if they go, they don't know to whom the vote. This means that these votes are um, for now nobody, and the political elite simply did not understand what is happening in the country. So, in reality, mm -hmm. if we move, if as we are historians or most of us at least here. Uh, it's like uh, Lenin's, and it was not Lenin's, but it's uh, said that it was Lenin's. Uh, the power is somewhere in the streets or somewhere in the public, no, in with the public institutions, because I sometimes it's even difficult to understand uh, on, on which, which institutions are ruling the country. And uh, these uh, political technologies are highly used, uh, and especially these uh, um, uh, social networks are highly used by the different political actors. So they sometimes abstain each other, not taking care what is happening uh, on the other uh, or, or in society. And here I will also respond to Dimitri about the Dodik announcement and about if there is any kind of communication. Uh, Dimitri, sorry, but I don't know, I have no such kind of information, but it's not difficult to have any kind of communication with Russian officials because uh, from Georgian side, we have visa-free uh, regime so they can, uh, Russian citizens can easily cross the border and they can meet somewhere in Georgia. Uh, on the other hand, Georgians need visa to travel to Russia. So that's uh, how it is work. So here I can't tell you anything directly, yes or not. Maybe one one addition. Yeah. So it's Russian it's citizens or citizens of Russia, because there are also one million migrant workers from Georgia that left for oh, Russia yes. in the 1990s. Some of them made their fortune there. And of course, when they come back, they will get Georgian citizenship. So it becomes much more uh, unclear, intermingled. So there are several uh, forms of leverage that can be used here. Yeah, and also according to Georgian legislation, uh, officials can't uh, public uh, uh, information to which na nationality they belong because it is uh, private personal information. That's why many, it's not clear how many citizens from the citizens of Russia who are ethnic Georgians who left Georgia in 90s. So it's quite a difficult uh, reality, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, we are closing the end of our session. We have two more questions which I will uh, propose and then if you'd like to respond, you can. First comes from London, um, where the question is, uh, what about the protests that have occurred in Abkhazia, in Zokhumi, if you have uh, a comment on that. And then we have a question from Erki Tomioya, who is asking about the role of the diaspora of Russians who are now in Georgia. Um, what is their relationship uh, with Russia, the ones who have come over recently? Mm -hmm. So about Abkhazia and uh, the same protests, I can't say that they moved in the streets, but they have such kind of fear because uh, Georgia um, society, so I think that the Abkhazia and the South society is an integral part of Georgia. So during the uh, demonstrations, the football club uh, Dinamo Sofumi supported uh, the demonstrants, and so they switched the music and started shouting Sofumi, Sofumi. And there was also another um, speech when there was, they hear the Sofumi, but uh, honestly what I listened in, um, my computer and um, so far it was not a military uh, for supporting any kind of military activities against Abkhazia or South Ossetia. It was just all oh, these territories are Georgian territory. That's all. Uh, and of, but uh, if we carefully watch um, RAM, is this military bloggers and other bloggers 
political bloggers. So yes, uh, in Russian language, especially this was converted in different message boxes that after this demonstration, the Georgian society is going to uh, fight or have a military operations against South society and Abkhazia, but there is no any kind of such wills in Georgian society, I can directly say. At, at this moment, definitely, and even maybe we are criticizing Georgian dream, and we have to, uh, but even Georgian dream several times mentioned that they are not planning any kind of military operations against Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Uh, but here is a problem that uh, the side, this conflict side, the South Ossetia, Georgia, Abkhazia, Georgia, they simply don't believe each other and then and they, they have no direct communications or direct formats of diplomatic relations. That's why if they don't believe each other, these kind of rumors are making much more louder and it makes a trouble in the uh, societies. Uh, but on the Erkis question, from my observation, I, I attended two such kind of meetings uh, when uh, the Russians who already live in Georgia organized and they wanted to share their experience. It was absolutely anti-Putinist uh, meetings, but uh, I can't generalize this because still these bubbles and networks are pushing you in different directions. So I can't judge with these two meetings for all, um, all over the other Russian diasporas who are in Georgia. So I, that's my yeah. comment on this question. Yeah, there, there is this business community that really relocated due to uh, overcoming the sanctions over Russia, so to save their IT companies and so on that are very much dependent on uh, uh, providing services to Western partners, so they really, and they live in their own way, so there is a whole uh, uh, Russian speaking infrastructure that was established during the last year with their own bars and so on, then uh, with all the uh, uh, um, um, ser servants and so all of them Russian or very good Russian speaking. So they are for themselves. Only a minority are these uh, political uh, opponents that really uh, have seen no other way. Some, the more famous ones, were even not allowed to enter into into Georgia, not from the Russian side, but from the Georgian side. Yeah? So that they did not, uh, they sent them back or something like that. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, it is really something that uh, the majority, I would say, are these business people. Then we have several thousands of poor people that were trying to escape this military service in the army. Um, so um, some of them are already without funds, so and the, the, then they will return. But of course, the, the economic elite or the economic middle class, they probably will stay on, but they are trying to uh, probably not to be politically too uh, outspoken. Huh? But uh, this is something up to further research. But uh, Georgian civil society should really try to establish a dialogue with those people that are critical to the Putin regime and to discuss really how to establish a living a, a, a relationship with Russia. Yeah? Russia instrumentalizes the conflicts with the Abkhaz, with the Ossets in Abkhazia and South Ossetia for their own purposes. In Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, this also became obvious to both conflicting sides that it is not an actor that is interested in solving the conflict, but using it really to increase its own influence. Thank you so much. Uh, we've come to the end of our session and I would like to thank uh, all participants from Rio de Janeiro to London, to Finland, to Reykjavik in Iceland, <laughs> and of course, to our two speakers from Tbilisi, Georgia. Thank you so much. We are very grateful for your time. Thank you, and all the best to History Without Borders in Finland and globally. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>